Bueno, buenos días a todos, espero que hayan arrancado bien este jueves. Mi nombre es eh, Tomás Lanardón, eh, soy eh, abogado, eh, intento especializarme y, y ser un experto en el en la industria de oil and gas, obviamente con, el, con foco en lo regulatorio, en lo transaccional. Eh, pertenezco a un estudio líder en, en energía, con oficinas en Buenos Aires, Montevideo y Neuquén. Eh, y es un gusto eh, participar de esta serie de webinars, eh, hoy específica sobre emanéis petroleros, eh, dado dado el, el, el nuevo, el, el momentum que hay en el sector para compra y venta de, de áreas. Eh, así, que, así que, bueno, bienvenidos. José, paso a contar un poco qué es la ATCC. Eh, la, la ATCC eh, es la Cámara de Comercio Argentina Texas, es una organización sin fines de lucro y de membresía voluntaria, fundada en 2016 con el objetivo de promover el comercio, la inversión, la educación y las oportunidades de networking entre Argentina y Texas. Principalmente se dedica a fomentar una fuerte relación económica entre Argentina y el estado de Texas y promover el crecimiento y la prosperidad para ambas regiones. Eh, yo personalmente tengo el privilegio de haber formado parte del, de la fundación del capítulo eh, Patagonia, allá por 2000 16, junto a Mariano Esperué y al gran Ignacio Carnicero, que, que Dios lo tenga en la gloria. Eh, dos aclaraciones de este webinar. Se está grabando, se va a subir al canal de YouTube a la ITCC, y si tienen preguntas, encantado, por favor vayan colocándolas en el cuadro de Q&A. El objetivo es hacer una exposición eh, de 30 minutos, bastante intensa, eh, quizás pasando por alto algunos temas que son importantes, pero dado que son 30 minutos intensos, me voy a dejar algunos temas para, para la sesión de Q&A, me encantaría que hagan muchas preguntas, comentarios, así después avanzamos con eso. Josefina ahora les va a contar un poco las actividades que tiene preparada la ATCC para la o OTC que se, se está viniendo. José. Hola, ¿cómo andan? Eh, mi nombre es Josefina Madeo, yo trabajo en la ATCC, y quería aprovechar el webinar eh, de la ATCC para contarles que eh, en el marco de la OTC, que es la feria más grande ¿no? del mundo en cuanto a oil and gas que se hace en Houston todos los años, la ATCC prepara una serie de eventos a los que nos queríamos invitar. Eh, cualquier, yo les voy a contar títulos para no robar tiempo y cualquier información adicional que necesiten al respecto me escriben, yo les dejo mi mail acá en el, en el chat. Eh, voy a contar que la, la OTC es del 6 al 9 de mayo, todos los años la ATCC hace un cóctel el domingo 5, de 6 a 8 de la noche, eh, aprovechando que está, ya todo el mundo está ya en Houston para ese momento, entonces los queríamos invitar a, a ese cóctel, eh, vuelvo a repetir, cinco, dos, domingo 5 de mayo, y después el jueves 9 de mayo hacemos una business round con compradores y vendedores de la industria de oil and gas, eh, en donde, bueno, esta, esta semana se estamos distribuyendo eh, formularios para el, aquel que se quiera inscribir como comprador o como vendedor o partner, si está buscando algún partner, y nosotros eh, macheamos las, las reuniones que se den en una especie de speed dating, en donde, bueno, tiene la posibilidad de los suppliers encontrarse 15 minutos con los vendedores. Más información, con gusto, se las doy y les dejo el email. Gracias por el, los minutitos. Thank you, Josefina. I see that there's at least two persons that I believe speak in English and do not speak in Spanish. I'm talking about Jonathan O'Connor and Michael Irauskin. Please, guys, if you are, if you speak Spanish and you prefer me to speak uh, this webinar in Spanish, please clarify that. The rest of, of the participants, I believe, are Argentine, so at least speaking Spanish. So, of course, if I do this in Spanish, it's going to be faster, better but I can do it in English, and it was prepared in English, so, okay? So, uh, I will begin with the presentation. Let me share screen. Just give me a second. Okay, I think I'm sharing now. Perfect. Well, everybody, um, I already talked about our law firm, MHR. And just, just like an introduction, I think many of us 
already work in the industry, some are newcomers and some don't don't really know in detail about Argentina, but boiling oil was discovered in 1907. YPF, one of the first national oil companies was created in 1922. So bottom line, this timeline tries to show that Argentina is, is an oil country. It's a country with a lot of knowledge in the oil industry and a lot of acceptance to the oil industry. And with those landmarks, the idea is to show that the oil industry was subject to different kinds of regulations and contracts uh, through the last 110 years. Some periods of apertura economica in which uh, there is freedom on, on, and on how private companies can develop the natural resources of Argentina and some periods in which the state has a lot of intervention in the sector and let's say YPF uh, controlled the sector and, and had a serious agreements with private companies. Um, since 1990, uh, Argentina, I would say, is governed by concession agreements in which uh, oil companies, whether national, international companies, independents, uh, have access to the reserves, own the production at wellhead, uh, and pay royalties. It's the typical tax and royalty regime. Uh, since 1990, okay? Uh, different from other countries, something peculiar in Argentina is that in addition to a national oil company, you have sort of provincial oil companies. Neuquén has Gas y Petróleo Neuquén, uh, Chubut has Petrominera, Santa Cruz, Fomicruz, and so on and so on, okay? Uh, during the past 10 years, there were key advancements, a lot of progress in Argentina as to the development of the oil sector, in particular, in the offshore and more important in the shale uh, shale business. Uh, the, 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 the risking of Baca Muerta shale formation is amazing. I, I will not spend time on this, but probably you already know about it. In 2014, 10 years from now, the, 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 there was a new had a current law that created special concession for shale projects, a special concession for offshore projects, reduction of royalties. In general, very uh, good incentives for these kind of projects. And the best of all, political consensus on, on that reform. It was uh, approved by mostly all, all the political parties. The word of many new concessions in Neuquén and in other countries, new regulation in the midstream that allows basically cheaper pay contracts that uh, are very helpful to finance this new infrastructure. License to frack in Argentina, after one, two years of some discussion with local communities, uh, and this relates to what I had said about uh, oil industry beginning in 1907. It's a country with a lot of knowledge and acceptance to the oil industry, and that sort of derives in the license to frack in Argentina. Domestic gas supply, um, pretty established through the Plan of Gas Agreement. So, uh, you know, foreseeability on, on the gas volumes that will be needed in Argentina. So that also gives uh, space to think about exports. Uh, and new crude oil export regime already in place. And in discussion, a new hydrocarbons law that sort of revamps and gives more rights, firm rights, and lower uh, export taxes on new export regimes. We're not going to talk about it today. The idea is to talk about this. This is sort of the... Sorry, Tomás. ¿Estás compartiendo? ¿Vos querés compartir pantalla? Porque no estás compartiendo. No estoy Pensé que por ahí era una introducción sin pantalla. No, 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 no. Estoy totalmente... Dale. ¿Ahora? Sí. Ah, Perfecto. Gracias por decirme. Eh, ok, ¿now? ¿Ahora? Ok, perfecto. So, this is a... This is a sort of graph that shows the different kind of stakeholders and agreements that are associated with an upstream project. Okay, today we're not going to talk about service contracts, uh, the concession with the province, uh, joint operating agreements, or etc. We're going to talk about farming agreements or uh, asset sale and purchase agreements or 
assignment agreements, you name it as you wish. The concept is that uh, an owner of a concession of a block assigns, sells a portion or, or the totality of its participating interest in that block. Okay, that's, that's the gist of this agreement. Uh, many reasons for that, right? Generally, it's uh, linked to the lack of public auctions in that specific oil region, oil basin. If they, we're talking about uh, a new oil province or, 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 or a country that is opening its market and, and, and opening a lot of you know, public auctions, then the farm out activity probably will be lower. When all the acreage is already allocated through concessions or permits, which is the case of Neuquén in Argentina or in many other provinces of Argentina, well then how, how you get into that acreage is through farming agreements, farm out farming, depending on the perspective, right? So that's, that's the key reason why we look into this uh, contract. Uh, we already know that oil projects generally need more than one player for uh, risk diversification, financial reasons, strategic alliances. Uh, I don't want to spend much time on this uh, or, or even exiting a market, right? You have a company that doesn't want to do any business anymore in a specific country. It exits the country, so it puts its portfolio of assets into sale through farm out agreements or uh, share uh, purchase agreements. Uh, one clarification on that. Um, another way to get into this acreage is buying the shares of the company that holds those assets, okay? That would be a share sale agreement and a, a, a typical uh, uh, shale, uh, the share transaction, okay? Today, we're gonna focus more on these kind of farm out agreements, okay? Um, so what are you buying? What are you selling? It's generally, it's a participating interest in a concession or in the US in a lease agreement. Okay, you're selling a working interest, a participating interest. And some questions you need to make yourself is, I am buying uh, all the strategic, the, 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 uh, all the, uh, all the uh, subsoil, the entire formations, or just one formation, just Vaca Morta, just Muli Chingo, just whatever formation would that be? Um, I, I mentioned about production horizons. In the US you, and in Canada, you see some horizontal severus agreements in the sense that some uh, companies just purchase access to a specific formation and not to other formations. Uh, are, I, am I buying or selling uh, just the complete acreage, the complete concession, or just some some paths or some wells? Uh, generally, is the whole package. But I'm mentioning these points because we are seeing deals uh, with with these features, right? Uh, another another question is: Am I buying a working interest in a JOA in a private agreement, or am am I also buying a working interest in the concession? Um, there is a difference. If you're buying an interest in the concession, then you have uh, direct rights against the granting authority. Who's the granting authority? Generally, the province that awarded that concession, or in the case of offshore blocks, it is the national state, right? Um, so that's what are you buying, right? Um, this this takes that the, the, we're gonna talk about. Uh, and what what will you pay, right? So you're getting inside, and of course you're obtaining an asset, you're obtaining reserves, maybe you're obtaining already production, so a cash flow is there. And how will you pay for that, right? And um, sometimes it's cash, uh, whether an upfront payment uh, or combined with a closing payment or a payment in installments through a period of time um, or a carry of the costs that should be uh, should be paid by the assigner. And just a minute on this. Uh, typically in the oil industry, carry, when you talk about carry, is that the assignee, you know, the farmee, the, the one that is getting in and says, I'm going to carry you through the exploration program, 
through the pilot project or even through the first stage of development of, the, of, of this project, that means that he's gonna pay for your costs in addition to his costs, okay? Uh, the different variations of carry that would be sort of financial carry, putting the money that you should pay or a, pro, a, or a carry that links with the production. So uh, I, you know, I, I will fund you uh, I will fund you and I will opt and obtain uh, the repayment of this funding through the production that is allocated to your participating interest. That typically is a case of uh, Gassi Petroleum Neuquén, in which hey, hey Pay in many contracts, it has a 10% working interest and hey Pay does not fund uh, in proportion to its working interest but rather it's being carried by its partner in the relevant JOA uh, and how it sort of uh, pays that financing through, through its production and sometimes a cap over that production, okay? So that's carry. And sometimes you get a combination of cash and carry, okay? Some cash and some carry, okay? Um, of course, it depends on the farmer staying in the block, right? If, if it is a full exit, if, you know, now we're talking about the YPF uh, portfolio of conventional assets that is putting into the market in which, uh, according to the news, YPF is exiting 100%, right? So in that case, of course, there is, there's no carry, right? You just need to pay for that, for that asset. Uh, well, alternatively, you will see these type of deals in which the farmer is leaving completely the use of overriding royalties, right? So, okay, don't pay me now, but I will have a 2% of the net proceeds of this block for the following 20 years, up to an amount of X, okay? So that's that's an override royalty uh, that that is used also in, in Argentina. Let's we'll talk about full assignment of the work and interest. You also have asset swaps, you know, uh, yeah, and, and we've seen this a lot in which in Spanish would say permuta from a legal perspective, it's it's an asset swap. So I give you a, a working interest in this block and in exchange for that, you give me your working interest in another block, okay? It can be in the same basin, it can be in different basins, uh, but that's an asset swap and it's, and it's uh, uh, dealt with in the farm out agreement, okay? Um, so timing, okay? How you structure these transactions? You generally, generally you have a, a, a term sheet between the potential seller and the potential buyer, uh, confidentiality agreement, of course. And at that point, you kick off a due diligence procedure in which uh, typically uh, the potential buyer identifies the key risks associated with that asset, you know, to understand, you know, the, the full picture of that asset. And we're gonna talk about that later. Um, once that due diligence procedure ends, uh, generally it comes with a binding or non-binding offer to give more strength to the negotiations uh, more seriousness, more skin in the game, and and after that, a negotiation and discussion of the transaction documents or the definitive uh, documents. We're talking about the format agreement. Typically, this agreement comes with other project agreements. It, it can be a JOA uh, uh, because you need to to govern, to structure the how those parties will deal with the operation of the block. Sometimes you have a marketing agreement in case the farmy, the one that is getting in, uh, doesn't have uh, a team in Argentina to market the production of that field, then you would ask the farmer to market your hydrocarbons, uh, maybe an infrastructure agreement for the use of facilities that exist in other blocks. It's very common in Baca Morte in which you need uh, probably you, you need you have facilities that uh, you know treat and evacuate or store production from different fields, um, and then you have 
other type of agreements, a gas balancing, if we are talking about uh, a, a gas block, okay, which you need to, to deal with what happens if there is an, an underlifter or an overlifter uh, in as regards to the take taking of the production, okay? Um, typically in the in the term sheet, what what we recommend is to try to identify the the key commercial issues in which you have an, uh, a a preliminary agreement that helps for the eventual discussion of the definitive agreements. Key to insert some kind of penalty clause or liquidated damages in case of violation of the exclusivity clause over that period of time in which the parties are negotiating the definitive agreements. Um, I will focus on that, okay? You can speak more, more about this term shit, but that's what I want to say at this point. Um, the due diligence, you know, buying an oil and gas block is sort of buying a company uh, you're, you you need to to analyze and the you know in the US with, which is another system right in which the surface owners own the underground hydrocarbons um, you, you 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 get the concept of title examination you know lawyers are sort of public notaries that analyze the the that the title is clean and that the uh, seller is in fact selling you an interest that is not subject to any encumbrance, uh, that is, uh, has not been uh, assigned to another party. So you're buying a property. And although in Argentina, you're sort of buying right, a concession right, a right to extract hydrocarbons, you need to be very assured that that title in fact belongs to the seller. And in that regard, Argentina has a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, how the legal system works, the fact that the province approves the assignment of that concession gives a lot of um, of stability uh, of of you know rule of law, etc to the buyer. you know uh, and then you need to check about the surface rights, right? How, how is the management of the surface owners? How are you paying them? How many surface owners do you have? Do you also have uh, state lands? Do you have to pay any compensation to the province for the use of those uh, uh, lands? Uh, you need also to check if there is any indigenous community within the territory of your block, which creates some additional restrictions as to the approval of the project. Uh, in Neuquén now there is a regulation that establishes that before issuing any administrative act on the project, you need to have sort of the opinion, a uh, first opinion of the indigenous community that is located within your block. Regarding environmental uh, considerations, you need to check, of course, the environmental status of that block, if there is any well to be abandoned, if there is any environmental liability that needs to be re remediated, and who's going to pay for that, right? Uh, litigation, here you talk about litigation that it may impact the operations of the block. If you have a surface owner that is problematic, if you have um, a service provider that may, because of this litigation, eventually terminate, uh, let's say, the processing contract, the, the rental of compressors. So in that case, you you may be forced to stop production because this service provider terminated that contract. So you need to check the status of the service agreements and any litigation associated with that. Uh, of course, if there is any debt associated with royalties and surface fee, which are payments to be made to the granting authority, uh, that that of course is important, but from the moment that the approval of that transaction from the province is done, either is it, if there is a free uh, debt certificate, that gives you a clarity that you will probably buy uh, a block with no debt associated, right? Um, we talk about this. This is key to check if, generally this happens when you're buying a working interest in a block with 
two or more parties. So in that case, uh, the you need to check if there is a right of first refusal, right of first offer, any preemption right on any of the parties that are not assigning, right? So, so you, to check if what you're buying is not subject to a rough to be exercised by another party. And, and that can happen with an assignment of the block or with a change of control of the shares of the party assigning the block. So you need to be very aware with that. Uh, a, ideally not to spend too much time in in the review of of a block that is that you know that that its rough will be exercised we can talk about that later um geological information is an issue uh of course what you're buying is a participating interest in a concession in a joa in a block but you're also buying the use of the facilities of that block, a percentage of the contracts of that block, and, and of course, a percentage of the ownership over the geological information of that block, okay? So that's, that's a, a key issue in, in this in this project. Um, so let's say the due diligence was successful. Now you understand the price that you should offer, what's the value of that uh, asset, so me, you make a binding offer or non-binding offer and you start negotiating the farm out agreement. So it's important to understand, let's say the different dates that govern the different uh, periods of this uh, commercial transaction. I cut to the chase. You have the execution date. That's the date in which the parties signed the contract. It can be uh, implemented through offer and an acceptance and don't have a, a, a contract that's signed by both parties that's generally used to uh, elude stamp tax. So you have the execution date. That's the date in which the agreement is in effect and obliges the parties. Uh, typically triggers, it triggers the obligation of the parties to request authorization uh, from the authority or, or it triggers uh, the um, obligation to get a waiver of the right of first refusal from uh, third parties. Uh, it triggers a lot a lot of what we say um, uh, acts to comply with the conditions present. So you have the execution date, you work together to obtain those CPs. Um, and in the and then in the meantime, let's say the period of time that goes from the execution date and the closing date, you have what we say the interim period, okay? So it's a period in which you already agreed to sell a percentage of the block, um, but the transaction has not been closed yet. So uh, it's a limbo. And so in, in, in that interim period, um, let's say if you're the far me, you wanna make sure that the far more uh, maintains the status quo. And, and operates a, the block on a reasonable and prudent manner. And that if it spends money, it's to comply with the minimum work obligations of the concession and those type of things, okay? And, and you have a, let's say, um, a commitment not to sell uh, any facilities of block, something like that, right? So once you get all the CPs, let me go, just to give you some example, uh, all those CPs, then the parties are ready to close the transaction, okay? Typically, as, as I was saying, uh, it's to obtain the approval from the government. Um, sometimes it's not only the approval, but, okay, I will buy this block if you get an extension of the concession because this block is about to expire and you need 10 more years to extract its reserves and to develop new reserves. So you need to get this extension before the buy, right? Or you need to conduct a baseline environmental study before a buy, or we need to negotiate um, JOA before I close. So it's, it's a lot of CPs. It depends on the complexity of the transaction of the type of field. But these are the CPs, the conditions present that once complied with, 
or waived by the parties, and then I can talk about that, you're ready to close the deal, right? And and um, generally at closing is when you pay uh, the price of the asset uh, with some caveats. Sometimes you divide that price in an upfront price paid at execution date and and the remaining portion of the purchase price paid at closing date, right? Uh, we already talked about this cash and carry deals. Um, typically, another thing that, that you can discuss in the interim period before closing is the development program that both as, par as new partners will execute in the block, right? Typically, to avoid any... any uh, any non-agreement uh, during the JOA life, you try the, as, as new partners to, to close this before you sell, right? It, it, it adds a lot of security to the deal, okay? If the party buying the block doesn't have uh, substantial assets or the price at stake is big uh, or it's paid in installments, we have a carry consideration, which is basically paid through execution of the work program, then you probably request, and it's very standard, a guarantee from another entity guaranteeing the obligation to pay the price and the carry of the farmee. Okay, that is very, very, very common. Uh, similarly, in Argentina, concessions can be assigned in guarantee. The meaning of that is that, okay, I assign you the concession as of closing date, right? But if you default on your payment of the carry consideration, then I will get back the concession, okay? And the good news is that the Argentine regulatory system um, already uh, establishes that the authority can approve this in anticipation. So you already know when you sign this agreement that if there is a breach of that carry or that purchase price that will be paid in installments, you can get the concession back, okay? And we can talk about that later if, if you wish, but that's really, really important from a security perspective, okay? So once you get the closing date, uh, your partners, the JOA is in effect. Uh, generally, the province already knows that there is a new co-concessioner or co-permit holder. Uh, and, and from that point in time, it triggers the obligation of the farmy to uh, inform the transaction depending the case, of course, to the uh, antitrust authority, okay? Um, there is one concept that I want to mention too. It's um, the concept of effective date. So let's say we signed the deal May 1st and we expect a closing in four months uh, later, right? So May, June, July, August, but the parties agree that the effective date, this is the moment the parties will uh, uh, be partners and will enjoy the benefits and the cost of that block uh, will be before closing, okay? Even before execution date, okay? Let's say effective date, 1st of January. So that means that once there is a closed deal, since January, the farmee had, a, had enjoys the production, but also suffers or pays for the cost to get that production, okay? And even is exposed to the to any liabilities associated with that block during that period of time, okay? That's very common uh, in the industry to establish effective dates different from the closing date, okay? Um, so the concept of reps and warranties uh, is, let's say, guarantees that the assigner, also the assignee, makes to the other party. Typically, I, get, I, 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 I declare to you, I guarantee to you that this concession is in full effect and is not subject to for future uh, proceedings. You know, this, this means that I have not received any notice from the province uh, trying to revoke this concession. Oh, I guarantee that I don't owe any royalty. Um, or I guarantee that there's no right of first refusal associated with this assigned interest. And this means that if 
that is not true, uh, uh, eventually that generates an obligation to to hold harmless the Fermi if that occurs, okay? And in many, many cases, when you want a clean exit, if, the, if you are the assigner, you will sell on an assets where is a condition, okay? And maybe those in Texas know, know this when you purchase a car, right? It's an assets sale. Yeah, I sell it as it is, okay? If it has debts, if it has liabilities, if the machinery is broken and, and this car will not make it through the next few miles, well, that's your risk. I'm selling this block. Of course, you will be entitled. Generally, this precedes uh, a due diligence in which you know what, what you're buying. But from a legal perspective, you're buying an asset with, pre with almost no guarantees, okay? And that's, that's very important for you guys to know and, and 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 this occurs a lot, in particular, in particular, with old assets, with 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 mature fields that have been uh, exploited for years and years. Okay. Uh, I think that I think we're done. It's one thirty-eight. Um, maybe to close this, the JOA is important to negotiated while you're ne negotiating the um, your, the FOA. Why? Because you don't want the scenario in which you struck a deal and then you start negotiating on 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 the JA because it's pretty important, right? Of course, the decision on who's going to be the operator is key. But if there is, a, are we going to allow secondments or second Ds from the Farmi, uh, which are going to be the overhead? Uh, allowed for the operator to pass through to the non-operators, which is going to be the pass mark. Uh, it's not the same 60% majority uh, than 80% majority. It's not the same two parties voting for that percentage than three parties or even one party. Uh, so the pass mark is really key to how this is very similar to a shareholders agreement of a, of a company, right? The, the governance of that block, how it's going to be dealt with, right? Um, maybe just to just to end, um, from a tax perspective, um, you need to, to check if there's any capital gains tax um, associated with the sale of this asset. You need to check uh any application of stamp tax which which as you know it's a very regressive tax uh that that there is one percent one point four percent over the the price of the document of the value of the document uh ideally if you enter into that agreement with an offer and acceptance letters there is no document per se self-sufficient that triggers stamp tax but then when you, in some cases, when you close the deal with the assignment of a public deed um, to be submitted with the province, that document can trigger trigger stamp tax. Okay, uh, I had mentioned that you need the approval of the province generally, right? Once you get the approval, you assign the participating interest in the concession through a public deed that's requested by the federal high commerce law. And that public deed is then filed with the province. Uh, so the province takes notice of that assignment and, and the title is, is, is in due order, right? Uh, so stamp tax is, is, is there when you need to watch out there. Um, that is on the goods that are actually sold, let's say, the uh, machinery or or some uh, expendable goods that are in the block that are being that are being sold as part of the transaction, not on the wells. Okay, on uh, although there is some opinion of the uh, federal tax agency um, assimilating wells with goods that trigger value added tax, many tax experts uh, state that that is that is not right. And, and and it's not uh, adequate to pay 
VAT over wells that are being assigned, okay? I'm not an expert at that, but I just mentioned the issue, okay? So guys, uh, that's that's it, 142. Um, I'm gonna see, uh, okay. Uh, so let me see if there's any question. Um, if, just give me one second. And in the meantime, please do so. If there's any person wanting to make any, any comment or question, I would appreciate that, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, here's a, a a very detailed question on um, if you have as a partner in your concession, uh, or you have a joint venture with a provincial oil company, uh, and you. Uh, assign a portion of your work and interest, of course, depending on the agreement, that will trigger uh, a, a rough to be exercised or not by the provincial oil company, right? Uh, but once that right is waived, uh, not exercised, and the provincial oil company consented to that assignment, the private parties can enter into JOA in which that provincial oil company is not a party, and, and that is to ensure that the parties take decisions without exposing any disagreements with the provincial oil company, okay? That's, that, that happens, that it can, can be done and it should be done, okay? Uh, there's a question here on, on if, if sometimes uh, the assigner, uh, uh, assigns a portion of its firm evacuation rights of the block. Uh, that, of course, depends on a commercial discussion. Um, but typically, you should know that that uh, this joint ventures and the JOA ends at the point of delivery of the block. The marketing and the evacuation of, of those volumes from the point of delivery of the block up to the market it's a risk and it's a business of the of each party, right? You may even have parties that want to sell the volumes in the Atlantic Ocean, others in the Pacific Ocean, others in the domestic market. It depends a lot on the profile of each party. So typically these, these deals close or, or end in the point of delivery. But again, and I was mentioning the marketing agreement, it depends on the case uh, and, 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 and if, your uh, party entering the block that doesn't have a team in Argentina and you want your production to be marketed by your partner and you want them to give you some access to a firm transportation contract that can be uh, settled in the context of the farm out agreement, okay? Okay, I have no more questions. I don't know, Lucas, uh, Josefina, you wanna, you wanna close this? Um, uh, I'm I'm all all ears. Okay, no. Eh, solo te habían dicho que que podías hablar en español en un momento, pero no queríamos interrumpirte y, y venías muy bien. Acabo de ver eso, pero bueno, creo que hay hay alguien que me da la sensación que habla solo inglés, así que vale la pena por eso. ¿eh? Bueno. Solo darte bueno. las gracias por haberte sumado a nuestra serie de webinars, muy interesante el tema, eh, a todos los participantes avisarles que tanto el webinar como la presentación de Tomás van a estar disponibles en el canal de YouTube, y, y bueno, te los esperamos en, en, los, en nuestros próximos webinars, que, que estén atentos a nuestras comunicaciones para, para saber qué se viene de después. Muchas gracias a todos. Bye bye a todos. Chao, Chao.